Welcome to session number two, two of many. Um, this is Peacemakers, just to make sure you're in the right place at the right time. And I'd like to start off to ask, did anyone play with this over the week? Did anyone try any of the techniques? And are there any quick success stories that you can talk about or disclose? No success stories. Yes, they're all Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 um, probably just like being aware of the, um, the different tendencies. And because I tend to just avoid the conflict. Um, and so being aware of that and trying to make sure that if there's conflict with something or like if I just don't feel at peace in a situation, that I still remain in that situation. Um, in some kind of way just to, to make peace and to be Awesome. A lot of good talking words right there. If you don't feel at peace with it, right? That's, a, that's an important part of the whole Peacemakers um, curriculum here. Um, also, finding out, gaining an awareness of what type you are. What are the things <coughs> that you find yourself doing? Um, and really want to stress the four G's, glorify God, get the log out of your own eye, gently restore, and go and be reconciled. Those four G's, along with that slippery slope that we talked about last week, is really important. Um, today we're going to be talking about some really, really scripturally based type of peacemaking. Um, and again, I would urge and encourage Please take a look at all the scripture references in this week by week because it really will change the, how you like even envision getting into conflict, resolving conflict, and the ability to go ahead and um, make some uh, changes that would be more uh, glorifying to God. Okay, with that, I am going to go ahead and start the video. And hope you got handouts because the video will follow those. Thank you. 
every session, we looked at a principle about the opportunity the conflict provides for us to reflect Jesus Christ and his gospel. In this section, we're going to move on a little bit further into this concept of living out the gospel of Christ. And let me explain just with, with an illustration how conflict really does provide some amazing opportunities, even though we wouldn't go looking for them. I came to Christ shortly before I started law school. And through law school, I, I found a group of other students who were, who were also growing in Christ. It was just a wonderful three-year period where I was most of the time reading the Bible and just getting excited about Jesus and sort of doing law school on the side. There was a time I was really growing and just falling deeper and deeper in love with Jesus. And when I got out of law school, I moved back down to Billings and uh, was clerking for a federal judge and to save some money, I was living at home with my folks again. And I was enjoying my mom and dad, we got along well, so it was just a delightful experience. Except for one thing, I was determined to convert my father. I did not want to go to heaven without my dad. And so it was just again and again and again, I was having conversations with my father, trying to persuade him to put his trust in Jesus Christ. It was a terrible way to try to evangelize. And one of those conversations, I got so frustrated. By the way, frustration, that's just a nice word for angry. I got so angry with my dad, I, I spoke disrespectfully to him. I said something, I walked away in a huff, went down to my room and closed the door. I was walking back and forth, I was talking to God. And I said, okay, Lord, I know that wasn't respectful. I know your word says honor your father and your mother. I wasn't honoring him and I wasn't doing things gently and kindly. I know that was wrong. And I know I should probably go up there and say I'm sorry. <sighs> But if I go up and apologize, he's going to think I'm a fool. Now, I didn't hear an audible voice, but it was awfully close. And the thought that came to mind was, Ken, your dad already knows you're a fool. <laughs> you made that really obvious in the last five minutes. The question is, does he know that I am real and I am working in your life to change you? That's the question. And I was immediately convicted by that. And instead of being worried about my image, vindicating myself, making myself look good, and I went back upstairs and just said, Dad, I'm so sorry. I just apologized to my father. And my dad was one of the most forgiving people the world's ever known. But it was the beginning of a transition where I was learning to humble myself, show more respect for my father, realize that evangelism is first of all living out the gospel rather than just declaring it. And over the next several years, and especially as my dad saw what was going on through the conciliation ministry, because after the clerkship, I started doing peacemaking. I was still living at home. And in the morning, my dad would ask me, you know, what do you do today? And I'd describe some cases and would mediate. And my father had been a lawyer and then a judge for 25 years. He'd seen hundreds of different lawsuits. And I remember again and again and again, he would say, son, I know you mean well, but I've seen 100 cases like that. And I can just tell you, it's not going to settle. I said, well, I haven't got anything else to do today, so I'll go and give it a try. And I come home that night, sit down to dinner, tell my folks. And my dad said, well, what happened today? I said, man, that it was just pretty amazing. I start describing these cases where people reconcile in really remarkable ways. And my father's initial response was, eh, there's a few flukes now and then. But he started noticing there was a lot of flukes. There were a lot of things that beat the odds. And I can still remember the night I came home, we had mediated all the way up till midnight. I pulled into the driveway, walked in the, in the house. My dad was sitting in the living room. And he said, what happened? He had begun to taste the divine impact that Jesus Christ can have in conflicts, especially among his people, but even with people do not acknowledge him. My dad had begun to taste it, and he was now getting more and more curious to learn about Jesus and his gospel. And that, that continued. Then the really kicker was I married Crowlett, and my dad adored my wife, and she was constantly talking to my dad in appropriate, winsome ways about Jesus. And thank God, shortly before my father passed away, he put his trust in Jesus Christ. But it's interesting that God used conflict, even my own conflicts, my own failures, as sort of the, the place to demonstrate that he is real and he's working in our lives. So I want to revisit this, this concept for just a minute and unpack a little bit more this idea that conflict is an opportunity. It really is. Conflict, in fact, provides three opportunities. And they're all summarized 
in a passage in 1 Corinthians 10. 1 Corinthians is a book of conflict resolution. Paul is dealing with a whole series of conflicts. Doctrine, who's the, the greatest apostle, married or unmarried, divorced, legitimate, um, what do you eat, what do you drink, etc. And, and just after he's dealt with these dietary concerns, Paul pauses, chapter 10, verse 31, he says, so whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, whatever kind of conflict you have, do it all for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or Greeks or in the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own good or my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I imitate Christ. And you look at that passage, Paul is describing three distinct opportunities. One is to glorify God, two is to serve other people, and three is to grow to be like Christ. Let's unpack those just a little bit here. Glorify God. Glorify God is where we are, are steadily growing in our awareness of who God is, what he's like, how magnificent he is, and we just can't stop ourselves from pointing people to him and saying, look at that incredible great God. What does it mean? How can we do this in a practical way? Think of, think of being a mirror. You know, a lot of people don't know God directly. They don't understand him. They don't believe in him. They don't read the Bible. They don't go to church. But they can still see him reflected in us. And think of him as like the sun shining down on us. His qualities of kindness, mercy, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, forgiveness, shining on us. And we're like a mirror, a polished mirror, reflecting the full radiance of his character in the lives of other people. As we forgive, as we are gentle, as we are kind, as we humble ourselves in the midst of conflict. Now, my nature is I'm like a brick wall. Nothing reflects off of me, this rough, coarse brick wall of a sinful man. And yet as God came into my life, began to transform me, I began in little ways to be reflecting him, little aspects of his character being uh, shown out in my life. So one of the questions that I often use when I'm counseling people on this particular step, how do you glorify God? is a question simply, how can you please and honor God in this situation? So when I think of glorifying God, how can I please and honor God in this situation? And let me, let me explain how powerful that, that question can be. I used it in lawsuits, church splits, uh, elder teams totally divided about to destroy a church, but I've also used it personally. And there was one time, a cool that night, uh, early in the morning, we got into some kind of a conflict, I don't remember what it was, um, I'm not an easy person out of conflict. I'm a lawyer, and, and I love to advocate, and I can use leading questions, and I can prosecute. But God gave my wife an equally powerful tool. She was a second-grade teacher. She has the voice. She can control, control 25 students with the tone of her voice. And so it's the prosecutor and the voice, okay? Now, we don't yell at each other, but definitely the tone of our voices changes. And so one morning, we had a disagreement about something, and we were in our bedroom, and we had our initial exchange, and then Corlett just sort of threw up her arms, walked out of the bedroom into the bathroom. She was in there stoking up the voice. I was in the bedroom planning my opening argument. I mean, I was going to really get into this thing. And I was literally just taking my first step toward the door to go and engage her. And the question came into my mind. It was just like a big flashcard. It wasn't audible, but it was right there. Ken, how can you please and honor me in this situation? You know what my reaction was? My mental just boom like that? I am busy now. <laughs> Go away. The last thing most of us want to do in a conflict is glorify God. When we're in conflict, we get very horizontal. It's my righteousness against your sin. I can focus on everything you've done wrong and, and indicate everything I've done right. It's just back and forth and back and forth at a horizontal level. But when we get our eyes up on God, when we're aware of God, if we're engaging God, trusting Him, believing Him, being faithful and obedient to Him, as He becomes the main focus, it changes everything. It changes everything. And that's what happened that morning when I thought, how can I please and honor God? It's like the wind just went on my sails. If you ever sail and someone used the wind, your boat just stops in the water, and that's how I felt. And I just, I just thought, oh, Lord, I'm so sorry. There's my pride again, my self-righteousness. Please, God, give me grace to humble myself and to take responsibility. So I walked out of the door and into the bathroom where Corlette was, and I said, honey, I am so, I'm so sorry. And what I discovered was that the Holy Spirit hadn't talked to my wife yet. 
She was still ready to run. She was like a linebacker down ready, you know, for the hot, hot. And when I came in, I said, honey, I'm so sorry. It's like, she, she didn't know what to do. She wasn't expecting it, but she sort of caught herself and sort of stood up and went, no, Ken, I'm sorry. I started that. No, Corlette, I started that. I'm wrong. No, Ken, I'm wrong. Again, that kind of delightful conflict when people are seeing more of their own responsibility, as Jesus puts it, that my wrongs were like a log and hers were like a speck completely changed the course of that conversation. And I've seen it do the same thing in major conflicts. Now, opportunity number two is to serve other people. Serve other people. And there's many ways that we can serve other people in a conflict. Number one, we can bear their burdens. A lot of people are in conflict because they're stressed out, they're worried, they're afraid, uh, they've had a difficult time with someone else and that tension is still in, in them and it's coming out at you. There's all sorts of burdens. Problems, difficulties. In Galatians 6, 2, Paul says, bear one another's burdens and fulfill the law of Christ. So then as you've opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who belong to the household of faith. So looking for ways to serve the other person. We're going to talk about ways to do that throughout this course. We can help people change through constructive confrontation. You know, one of the things I love about teaching peacemaking my family is we slowly have learned to be able to receive criticism and correction from one another because we live with each other we know each other well and to do that and, and so often it's actually been my son jeff he's been like my backup conscience when the main conscience goes down jeff is right there remember one time i had a disagree with corlett and and i thought i'd won and you know i thought it was over with conversation was ended when in my study and a few minutes later jeff came into my Studying, he said, Hi, Dad. I said, Hi, Jeff. You're just still a little guy. And he said, Hey, Dad, did you know mom's crying? Uh, no. Yeah, and they think it's your fault. So <laughs> I love having that, that kind of a conscience in my household. Sometimes Megan did it for me, and sometimes Corlette. For some reason, I resisted my wife more. I'm sure that's just simple pride, but I'm glad I had kids. Other times, we can help people by teaching and encouraging them by our example. They can see us do something, and they can look at it and say, boy, I want to learn how to do that myself. Now, opportunity number three is to grow to be like Christ, to be more self-aware. Where, where am I not yet conformed to his image? Where do I need to grow? What are the desires that sometimes war within me? What are the, the agendas and goals I have that are not really honoring to God? We search our own heart. We search our heart when we discipline ourselves. We we move out in a way that we're more self-disciplined, self-controlled. You think of uh, Romans 8, 28, 29. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Even conflict, God wants to use for our good, to polish us, refine us. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that we might be the firstborn among many brothers. So in a conflict situation, God is working for our good to conform us to the likeness of Christ, to help us, to, again, to put off pride, self-righteousness, um, self-sufficiency, all the things that are, are contrary to the character of Christ, to be made new in the attitudes of our mind, as Ephesians 4 says, and to put on the, the very image of Christ in knowledge and righteousness and holiness. One of the ways that I've found is very helpful to sort of summarize those three opportunities is to think of conflict as, as a stewardship opportunity. I love the concept of stewardship, where in the Bible there's a, an owner or a king, and he has people working for him, stewards, people he trusts, people he gives resources to. Think of uh, Matthew 25, that the, the king who gave talents or resources to different servants. He said, go and invest these things and, and bring, come back to me with a return on them. And if you think about being a steward in conflict, you think, okay, Lord, you've put me in this situation. You've given me the resources of your word and godly counsel and, and godly friends who can advise me. I've got your Holy Spirit. I've got so many resources at my disposal. And most of all, this opportunity that you brought about to now reflect Jesus Christ, to show that he is real, he is working in me. And if, if we realize that we are stewards, that the conflict is not really ours. We don't own the conflict. God does. He's put us in a situation where we can invest all the things he's given to us, including the training we have as peacemakers, to make him look more beautiful and real to the people around us. Now, one of the most important things about stewardship is this, and I've had to share with people again and again, 
is a steward realizes that we cannot control the outcome. God is sovereign. He's the one that out controls the outcome. So we don't base our success on results. Success or steward is faithful obedience. We've done the best we can with the resources and instruction and guidance we have. And I've had to share that many times in divorce cases, for example, that even when people do everything the Bible says, even if they take all the advice that we might give them in pursuing reconciliation, they can't control the other person. And that other person, the only way can control that other person is God through the Holy Spirit. And so to realize that even if you've done everything right and the other person still decides to leave, you still can say, Lord, I did the best I can. I've had many sessions that ended where there wasn't the reconciliation we wanted, but I would debrief with the one party afterwards. I would simply say, I know you're disappointed in the outcome, but I sincerely believe right now when God is looking down on this situation, he's looking at what you've just done, what's in his heart and mind is well done, good and faithful servant. We do not have control over the results. We only have control of our faithful obedience to God. Now, as we live these things out, it's really important to realize one of the goals of peacemaking, obviously, is peace. Is peace. And peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is actually the presence of shalom, of wholeness, of, of serenity of heart and mind and soul and relationship with other people. It's, it's the presence of those things, not the absence of some kind of overt conflict. And you can often think of peace in, in three different dimensions. There's most importantly peace with God through Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.19 says, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of of the cross. God sent his son Jesus Christ into the world to bring peace between us and him, to reconcile this huge chasm of estrangement and bring us into a relationship, adopting us as his, his beloved children and eventually taking us to be with him. So peace with God is incredibly precious above all things. But God also calls us to pursue peace with one another, what the Bible often calls unity. Now, don't ever confuse unity with uniformity. A lot of people will talk about uh, unity, but what they really want is uniformity. They want you to think like they think, believe like they believe, and do exactly what they think should be done. And that's not always the case. People can have good faith differences and yet still have unity of purpose. So, if, for example, Romans 12, 18 says, if it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And so clearly implicit in that is we have a responsibility to seek peace, do everything within our power to be at peace with other people, reconcile with them, but to recognize that they still have to make choices on their side whether or not they'll be at peace with us. And the final kind of peace we can pursue is peace within ourselves. And it's interesting, this is what most people are usually interested in, just want to have some peace. They're usually thinking about their own peace. Um, the Bible talks a lot about how do we find true inner peace. Isaiah 32, 17, the effect of righteousness will be peace, and the result of righteousness, quietness and trust forever. It's when we're righteously before God that we have a sense of peace. Our conscience is clear as we obey Him, even in the midst of conflict, doing things like loving our enemies, doing good to those who hate us, blessing those who curse us. Things we don't feel like doing, and yet if we want to have peace in that situation, obeying God is the key for Isaiah 48, 18. Oh, that you had paid attention to my commandments, then your peace would have been like a river, your righteousness like the waves of the sea, paying attention to God's commands. So what that really tells us is that inner peace is a byproduct of being right with God and other people. We're not going to find inner peace if we're at odds with other people, and especially if we're at odds with God. We have to pursue that kind of peace first, walking faithfully, humbly before God, being in his word, being under good teaching, learning more and more about him and how we walk in obedience and faithfulness, reaching out, resolving differences with other people, pursuing peace and reconciliation with others. That's where we find that peace. And our witness for Christ is actually enhanced as we have that kind of peace. Jesus talks about this a lot in his Gospels. John 13, 34, he says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know you're my disciples, 
feeling love for one another. So it's by our love for one another, people are looking at us and saying, oh, you must be a follower of Jesus Christ. And that's like my dad, when he started seeing this proud, arrogant, forceful, self-absorbed son being changed into someone who was fundamentally different, little by little, my dad began to realize there, there must be some supernatural force involved here because this is not my son the way I've known him to be. So it's our love for one another, our reconciliation. We forgive people in a way that human beings can't forgive on their own. Those watching go, wow, I couldn't have done that. How did you do that? And those are opportunities to point to Christ. John 17, Jesus even goes uh, more deeply. This is his high priestly prayer. He knows he's only got a few hours left with his disciples. He's not dealing with secondary issues right now. When you've got just a little while with your loved ones, you're going you're to zero in on the most important things. In his high priestly prayer in John 17, I do not ask for my disciples only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you've given me, I've given them, and that, that they may be one, even as you and I are one. I in them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them, even as you have loved me. That they may be one, they may be one, they may be one, unity in the body of Christ. Not necessarily uniformity. We can have Baptists and Presbyterians and Methodists. We can have differences in many ways. But we still are, have one purpose, which is to exalt Christ, to grow to know him better and make him known to others. And here's how that can be so powerful. When I was in uh, law school, I was working uh, as an intern, and there was a young uh, paralegal named Mary. And uh, she was going to a church that I didn't think was really preaching really the Bible very well. And so I was trying to get her to come to my church. I was just excited about being a new Christian. So I, I finally persuaded her to come to my church. And I was really, I think, to show her what a really good church looked like. You know, this is what a real church looks like. So we're in there sitting down, and my pastor gets up front, and he says, before we start this morning, there's something I need to do. He says, Carl, would you come up here? I went, oh, no. Because in Sunday school the week before, the pastor or the elders had gotten into a quarrel and got nasty. I mean, they both got pretty sarcastic with each other. And I'm sitting here, here's the pastor calling Carl up front. I'm going, oh, no, he's going to rebuke the elder in front of everybody, and I've got company. And I just, I was so shallow in my understanding and still so immature. Carl comes up there, Dale puts his arm around his shoulder. He says, last week you all saw something that was just wrong. Carl and I just got into a conversation and I responded sinfully and Carl was too. And we just want you to know how sorry we are as leaders of the church that just set such a poor example. We want you to know that an hour after Church ended last Sunday. We were together for the fasting and reconciling. But because all of you saw what we did, we knew we had to get up here this morning and ask your forgiveness too. Now, I was still so immature in my faith that I was embarrassed by that. I thought, oh man, I wish this hadn't been a Sunday. I brought Mary. She's going to think our church is horrible. And so the worship service ended. We were driving, driving away. And I was just hoping she'd forget about it. Of course, the first thing she says when we get in the car was, man, I've never seen a pastor do that before. Yeah, right. Poor, beautiful day, isn't it? I've tried to change the subject. He said, no, I'm serious. I, my pastor would never do something like that. Could I come with you next Sunday? And she came back three or four more Sundays and finally received Jesus Christ as a ship. <laughs> we think we're going to lead people to Christ by us being squeaky clean and impressive. How much better it is when people see how much we need a Savior, how weak we are, how prone to wander, and yet we have this magnificent God who's working in us and through us. That's what brought uh, Mary to Christ, was seeing God working in our pastor. Now, this, this goal of having unity and peace and reflecting Christ is so important. It's, it's Jesus in Matthew 5, 23 and 24, says we should seek reconciliation even ahead of worship. He says, if you're offering your, prayer, your gift at the altar and you'll remember your brother has something against you, leave your gift in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled, then come and offer your gift. We can't even worship God in an acceptable way if we, if we are at odds with somebody we haven't made every reasonable effort to be reconciled. You see, peacemaking shows that we take the gospel seriously. God so loves the world that he sent his only begotten son 
when we were estranged from him, at odds with him, unreconciled to him, it's so important to him, he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for us. And he calls us to be equally committed to that kind of peacemaking reconciliation. And as I've said a few times already, peace is so important to God that he commands us, even as Christians, to take <clears throat> our lawsuits to the church. If we've got a, a disagreement with another Christian, rather than going into a civil court, God said, bring it to the church. Find wise and godly people there to bring that, that dispute in, into the body of Christ so we can not only resolve the substantive issue, but especially bring the gospel of Christ to bear in a way that shows the magnificence of Jesus in his gospel. You see, living at peace is truly central to our witness for Christ. Don't even tempt me. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll let that sink in just for a minute. Um, I thought that was a very powerful one this week. Um, it speaks to a lot of scripture. Um, if I haven't made it clear, the book really goes into a deeper dive of all of this. Um, there's, there's a ton of information on a lot of the topics that Ken talks about. Ken's just touching the surface on these points. And the book really does a deeper dive. If you want an even more deeper dive into this, the website, rw360.org, um, is a really um, powerful website because all of this material is a free download. Uh, you can buy the book, the book's like 10 bucks, 12 bucks, something like that. It really should be in all of our libraries, for sure. Um, so I wanted to just do a really quick review, and I'm going to do that, and I promised last week this was going to be an interactive class, so enough of me talking. Um, one of the uh, processes of just reviewing this is I've given people a few um, scripture verses to read. So would the number one person read 1 Corinthians, that conflict provide opportunity? So from 1 Corinthians uh, 10, 31 through 11, 1. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do all things for the glory of God. Do not have been Jews or Greeks or the church of, of God. Just as I also please everyone in all things, not seeking my own benefit, but the benefit of the many, so that they may be saved. So be imitators of me, just as I am Christ. Awesome, thanks. And we move on to glorify God. This is the theme of this whole curriculum. And really, it's so counterintuitive um, to think of conflict this way. And I, I'm probably going to be a broken record throughout this uh, Sunday school class saying that. Um, opportunity to glorify God. Um, number two. Psalm 37, 5 and 6. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the day. Wonderful. Thank you. Number three, uh, that's Ephesians uh, 4.29. Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good is for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give you grace to those who hear. Wonderful. Imagine if we took that mindset when we talk about conflict, when we have disagreements, um, it's just not the first thing on our on our thoughts. Um, number four. Galatians six, verse two and verse ten. 
bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Verse 10, so then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. And then Galatians 6, 1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Wow. <laughs> imagine, imagine what it would be like. And I literally want you to think about what it would feel like with inside of yourself in the response of others and how to glorify God. That SOG, self, other, and God uh, that we talked about last week, that relational wisdom part. If we restored gently and watched ourselves at the same time, and you heard Ken talk about the stewardship of, of conflict, that opportunity, and really wanted to capture that as, as a way to bring in um, a different mindset. And that mindset is um, something that we have to practice. So I'm going to turn this over to you. Okay. Just a couple of things <clears throat> I wanted to touch on. Um, one of the things Kim talked uh, talked a lot about in there is that conflict uh, is an opportunity that we need to steward. And um, I have no idea how to put this thing on. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Um, <clears throat> and I and I wanted to talk about that a little bit because I think that um, when we're in conflict, uh, we don't think that way. Uh, and I loved his, the expression that he used on here today, where he said, uh, "In conflict." we get very horizontal. What did he mean by that? How do we get horizontal? Yeah. Yeah. Me, me. You, I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, it, we think of our righteousness versus the other person's sin. We don't think about how we can glorify God with our actions in response to conflict. Yeah, good. Any other, any other thoughts on that? Kind of like a soc it reminds me of soccer games. You know, the balls kind of go back and forth and back and forth. Nobody ever scores. Uh, just kind of back and forth, back and forth. And that's what I think that's a lot of what he means. Um, and and I think that uh, I, I experienced this very thing yesterday. Um, or I should say I should treat it kind of like Paul. I know a man who went up to the seventh <laughs> heaven, and <laughs> uh, and I'll tell you the story about him, but. Um, there, there's somebody that I live with, or that he lives with, that uh, <laughs> that uh, got in, that were in conflict yesterday, and it it really uh, struck me how all day long I wanted to be horizontal, uh, and 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 I think that the thing that really came to me later is we have to make a conscious choice to get vertical. We ha we have to really stop and think. Um, you know, okay, what's going on here on a vertical level? I, I know we're banging heads like this uh, on the horizontal level, but how do I get vertical? How do I, how do I appeal to God? How do I begin to think through uh, what it means to glorify God in this situation? And um, so I was thinking about this earlier. Um, usually when, you know, Ken in that first video said um, that, you're going to get homework uh, in watching this. Usually teachers don't get homework. Uh, but but it, was, it was a great lesson for me. It's still, it's still one that impresses me a lot just because it made me realize as a, just as a center, I have that tendency to stay horizontal and, and not to think about uh, the vertical, not to really consciously, diligently stop and think okay, what's going on here? Uh, so I just wanted to encourage you that way. Um, so one other thing uh, that uh, is in the chapter on this book that I think is, is, is very, very helpful. Um, 
he talks about, again, uh, conflict being a stewardship opportunity. And um, he talks about the passage in Ephesians. If, you might want to just turn to this. It's Ephesians 4. He's especially good on this. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll give you the phrase that, that I think is particularly good. But it, in Ephesians 4, uh, beginning verse 1, he says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And the NIV says, and, and this is one I'd like you to think about, and the NIV, NIV on that last verse says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Um, in the book, uh, Ken talks about that that make every effort is a strong word. It means to strive. It means to fight for. He says uh, that it means to strive like a gladiator. And so he paints that picture of a, a gladiator in the ring uh, fighting uh, to win, fighting to survive. And, and that's the picture that he paints of how we need to fight for peace. Um, who are we usually fighting, by the way, in, when we're fighting uh, in the ring for peace? Who, yeah, we're usually fighting ourselves. Uh, we're, we're usually uh, trying to defeat ourselves in our own, our own sense of our own righteousness, our own justification. Uh, and I, I, anyway, I love that picture that he paints there of, of striving like a gladiator. It's, peace is not something that comes easily. Uh, it really is something, because we're sinners, because we are fallen as we are, uh, we just have that natural tendency to fight in the soccer game and uh, go back and forth rather than to really stop and think, what is God, in his providence, why did he bring me into this situation? Why, why am I finding myself where I am? What do I, what is it that he, what's the lesson that he has for me to learn? I think those are the main things I was going to uh, touch on. Chuck, did you have any others that? Yeah, there's there's some things that conceptually. Oh yeah. Someday I'll graduate to the big class and we'll have all the amenities. <laughs> Sorry, it was just too tempting. Um, good segue into what I was going to talk about, though. Um, some of the things that we do to avoid conflict or in some ways not try as hard or authentically, when we do try to glorify God, it goes back to what Ken talked about, having that squeaky clean image of what Christians really are. And probably in the last four months, I've had at least a half a dozen folks, and you, you might even know some yourself, that won't come to church, won't kind of engage with Christians because they deep down know they're not clean enough, they're not good enough, um, they have a history that they would not be accepted, acceptable to God or to a church. And so when we have that squeaky clean um, image or perspective, we almost do a disfavor to that end. Uh, second, it's really not an accurate picture of ourselves either. So that's why conflict really gives that opportunity to kind of just go there and, and allow us to be uh, more authentic in the way we glorify <coughs> God and why we need a savior, why we need that God that we uh, want to glorify. Again, this is interactive. Any thoughts, concerns, questions so far? Yes. Um, when you ask the opening question about any successes, I didn't want to say anything because my uh, 
situation that came up, the other person uh, was wanting to flee. And so I thought, you know, this is really great. You know, I'm trying to speak peace, yet the person is not there or interested. And what Ken was talking about, what was helpful is faithful obedience is being a good steward. We don't have control over the outcome. So when we go into those situations and we get a brick wall, um, do we keep trying or just say, well, Lord, I tried and it didn't work, so I'll leave the results up to you? Or I mean, how do we come out of it? So we're not totally like, wow, I, you know, I'm bad, or I did wrong, or, you know? Great situation, great opportunity. Thanks for practicing. <laughs> and really, there's, there's a couple things there. First is, how often do we really try to muscle through these situations? We just think that we have the answer, <coughs> that we have the solution, and in, in, in my practice, I have a saying. Just because you have the answer doesn't mean you have the solution. Okay? Because it's really important that we can have the answer. We can have what we think is solution and just hammer that, and we miss the whole opportunity. Uh, there's, uh, when I teach the RW, the Relational Wisdom, uh, curriculum. Uh, there's some really good clips to that end, and that's just one of those conflict opportunities that we, again, we just pass up. We, <laughs> that gaining that awareness of the opportunities that we do have. Second, control what you have control of, right? You don't have control over the other person. If they're going to flee, uh, which is very common, now, now you know in that situation what type of conflict peacemaker or peace faker they may be, you know, to, to avoid, right? So they may not respond in that situation, but the more consistent that you are, number one, and remember, the Bible is the greatest love story ever written. So when we keep trying love, 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 <laughs> they become less fearful and less fleeing. And so that's, this time, that didn't necessarily work, but the opportunity is still there with the next conflict with that person, maybe. And I, I think it's important that we glorify God by trying, but also check in with ourselves on how can I love this person? Because peacemaking is about representing how God loves us and glorifying God in that fashion. Yeah. <clears throat> Add to something to that, that you know, the, I think the Romans verse is so helpful there because it says, if possible, as far as it is contingent on you. <laughs> so in, in terms of, of me, have I done everything that I can do? If I have, then I can have uh, peace. And uh, so... I think that's the real challenging question is, have I, have I really done what, what can be done? Every, have I done everything I can do uh, as far as it's contingent on me to be at peace? And obviously, there are a lot, of, a lot of situations where, you know, the other person has no interest in peace. Um, you know, they love war. And, uh, and we, we live in a time where there's more and more love of war. So um, we can only do uh, what we have opportunity to do. Yeah, and excellent, yes. Um, just to follow up on that, um, so I can understand, especially when you're dealing with non-believers, they're not looking to seek peace, they don't have peace. Um, but when they're dealing with other Christians in the church, especially in the local church, and there's somebody who is fleeing from resolving conflict or is obstinate toward seeking reconciliation, wouldn't you think it's good to ask for help 
for someone to go with you to reach out because it seems like it, it's not biblical to just allow a fellow believer to run away from conflict because it's just going to, I mean, like that doesn't seem right. Yes. Um, great situation to talk about. And I'll do another shameless plug for the book. <laughs> the, the book does a deeper dive in that, and it goes back to that unity that's been talked about. It goes back to um, even the uh, how, how do we go about conflict. Um, and yes, we, we want to gently restore. And so how we step by step do that is, is vital. And uh, within the church, we should have those types of opportunities. Okay. Um, thank you. That's awesome. Man, I just want to think of that there. Uh, I think that to um, the key in those situations is to recognize that you're doing it as a service to them. I think sometimes, just for myself, I want to beat somebody up so you'll be at peace with me. And, uh, and I think that, we, you know, the right attitude is, is I want you to have the joy of peace. Uh, I want to serve you. I'm willing to go the extra mile to, to create, you know, to achieve peace. So just keep going. Yes. Um, it's, it's, it's a, um, sometimes like a flesh wound where, you know, apply pressure until <laughs> the bleeding stops, you know, just in, in conflict, how we just want to keep pressing forward. Yes. I just want to comment that even though we mentioned the other person does not seem to want peace, they want to be right. More, more likely than not, when you're in conflict, both people want to be right. I love what you just said. My husband wrote down, peace mode, maker versus peace baker. They don't want peace, they want to be right. So often, to end a conflict, it appears that, well, they just don't want to make peace when they just want to be right. Yes, another saying. Do you want to be right, or do you want a relationship? <coughs> you have to make the choice. Yes, very good. I wonder, too, if sometimes people's idea of peace is different. So, you know, someone thinks that they might want peace, but you're kind of like projecting what that means on the other person. The other person, you know, might want a little bit of distance or something, you know. So I think that could, and if there's not communication there, it gets very complicated um, because really, if you would just agree with me, we would be at peace. <laughs> it's just easier. I mean, come on, choose easy. Um, so yes, but there are folks that not only want to be right, the, uh, the sister comment to that is, I want my way. I mean, again, just agree, we'll all be at peace. So that community, it's almost by the third transaction, it goes off the rails. And a good way to catch yourself is ask yourself, what's the goal of this conversation? What am I trying to accomplish by what I'm saying? And when we think about glorifying God, which, you know, like Ken said, it had to be in front of me. And I said, oh, I'm busy. Okay, in, in the moment, that's very hard to do. But it's a great question because as soon as you feel that <clears throat> sensation, <clears throat> you know it's not gonna go nicely, peacefully, okay? So when we listen to our bodies, which is a, a key thing here, but understand asking yourself, what am I responding to? Gaining that awareness. But really, what's the goal of the conversation. Why are we even talking about this? What is it that we're trying to accomplish? And then ask ourselves, oh, after a deep breath, how can I glorify God? In our enraged to engage culture, that's not even on the radar. That is not even being considered. So understand it is that difficult to do. Communication is far more difficult than we think study after study that we, we look at, really people have a tendency to overestimate how good of a communicator they are. Uh, 
Okay. If, if we drill down, if we drill down on that same research, yeah. yes, <laughs> yes, it, the, the same re research says we overestimate how good of listeners we are, okay? And I'm thinking God gave us two ears, one mouth, that's the biggest clue I can think of. But really, these are really difficult things, which is why Ken talks about practice, 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 and that they're skills that we have to implement. We have to gain an awareness of how we do this. And um, yeah. It, it seems a logical thought when we say we we need to glorify God. That is a hard one to even get past. Uh, we hardly get to number two, three, or four if we get that one right. And I think of Christ that he glorified the Father in the greatest way by dying. <coughs> and our imitation of him is dying to self uh, right off the bat. That is the quickest way to glorify God is to die. Yes. To, to die to ourselves um, there, there used to be a word surrender, right? The kind of surrender. Again, how countercultural can that be? You know, we're supposed to be winners, and we're taught to surrender. That doesn't even make sense. That that means you're weak. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, that's a, a very good way of putting it. Also, uh, life giver, life taker. Absolutely, and and that's for again apply the S O G, the SOG plan, self, other, and God, and God's all about life for ourselves, and for others, and for Him. So yeah, very good. Thanks. Yes. We do not like to log in our eyes, that's, that's for sure. Thank you, very good. Um, it, it, it brings up the, the necessity, I, I think, in, in that moment, in the conflict moment, of both people feeling as if they've been hurt. How often do people just scream and shout because they don't feel or believe 
they're being heard. And allowing that, again, a lot of deep breaths <laughs> during that time, but it's, it's really the ability for us to um, have them have that impression that they're being heard, they're being understood, in, in some ways, slow everything down. Slowing everything down often helps. And giving that grace in that moment is the grace God gives us every day. I, I would imagine God would be very impatient <laughs> if he would look at myself all the time. And, and that is what we need to do in that, in that moment, that vertical as opposed to that horizontal. Absolutely, yes. Like to see is uh, like a small group of men and women that um, have taken this class or understand and have you know a passion for helping you know people in the church. Where if there's some little small conflict or something, they could first go to one of these people or several of these people and say, look, you know, I'm having this issue, and I think I'm right, or whatever they want to say, and and kind of work through it so that it doesn't get to a place where, um, I mean, our church is so large right now, um, you know, to overload a pastor or somebody else, you know, there's so many, the, the larger we get, the more conflicts there are. Well, there, there is good news to that end. Um, there are those opportunities. Okay, uh, there is training. Um, Ken has what's called a sower's ministry that takes RW, uh, the, the relational wisdom curriculum and the peacemaking curriculum for churches to engage in. Um, so yes, that's potentially what, what, can, what can happen. Um, and you know, I, I think those are, those are things that as a church we can continue to, to look at, um, trainings all the time, and um, allowing folks to be equipped. You know, some of this is gaining the awareness, and then once you're aware, now what do I do? Okay, well, we need the equipping as well. So, um, yes? All right, so going back to a couple of things. So you just said we make sure that a person knows that her or the doubt go a long way. Um, if we hear them, we're not actually doing it. Excellent, excellent. Um, we call those attending behaviors, okay? We just attend to them. And again, what's the goal of this conversation? Well, glorify God, yes. Do they feel heard? Yes. Do I feel heard? Yeah. And again, slowing it down, okay? Our tone, our our words in the moment when they're more selective as, because, as, as opposed to, yeah, I'm good, <laughs> when, when we're not. Um, but also things like the sense of touch um, can be good, you know, holding their hand um, if that's appropriate, um, and ask for clarification. Uh, sometimes people think that's inflammatory. Or this is what I hear you, you saying, or am I hearing you right? Am I getting this correct? Um, sometimes even writing it down, because we can forget in the moment what's being said. So sometimes just writing it down can, can be helpful, okay? Um, a lot of deep breaths, okay? Um, and when, when we can keep that authentic process going, um, that can be good. I can see the packing behavior happening, so which means our, our time is up. Um, I can't thank you enough for your participation. That's kind of how the class is, is to be taught. Um, practice, practice, practice. Read along if you can. Go to the website and uh, see you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.